And at that time, the coward boys, they pick up those, that paraphernalia and they begin to play out, worshipping Krishna. And Krishna becomes so happy and he's laughing. And the devas at that time are somewhat bewildered by Krishna didn't seem as happy with our offering as he is in this very sweet way. So again, this contrast, constantly it's coming up because for the devotees entering into these topics, this um, conflicting mentality, because like for example, we're studying this Vedanta, very rich, very powerful, filled with essential truths and high-minded philosophy, beauty, and so on. But at the same time, we're hearing about Krishna, who's not even capable sometimes of dressing himself. This is the same supreme. How do we make these reconciliations? And it's only by the mercy of principally Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's principally his mercy alone, but his empowering our consciousnesses through the gift of the Maha Mantra to make this reconciliation between this Aishwarya and Madhurya. And the devotees can do it very simply. Actually, we can hear all Vedanta for a few hours. And then we can hear all of Krishna's pastimes and very comfortably accommodate these contrasts. I was actually thinking how complementary our classes are here in Puri 2016. Because Vaikanas Maharaj, he's speaking from Bhagavatam, we know Thakur's notes on the Bhagavatam, the structure of the Bhagavatam. And Prakashat uh, Prabhu, he's speaking on very powerful Vedanta philosophy. And I'm just speaking on some childhood pastimes. But the synergy between the three aspects of all three classes, I think you get a very broad, wholesome appreciation of the entirety of the Bhagavatam. It gives the entirety of the picture. So somehow or other, it's been orchestrated by Gurudev or whoever. But we have these three um, different presentations going on simultaneously. And there's no confliction whatsoever. They all entirely complement each other. I was learning these four aphorisms of the Rama Sutra this morning. And how beautiful uh, this uh, Shastra, Yonish Bhat, uh, and Ananda Vyadi, and Mahimya Vyasat, and the other Anatur, and Brahma Jignasa, John Marjan. Yes. All, and, and how much it complements actually this. There's nothing divorced, there's nothing separated. If we take some of these chapters, as we've been discussing, separately from the entirety of the Bhagavatam, try to develop a mood, try to develop an appreciation for the entirety of the subject matter, because it's like Krishna Chandra Prabhu was just saying, this radical difference between what is Aishwarya and what is Madhurya, not even Lord Brahma can really appreciate this, who is our Adi Guru. So who are we? What qualification do we have? The qualification we have is the direct mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all the Rasik Acharyas coming from Sri Rupa Goswami. These are tangible, powerful um, gifts of mercy that we have been given. So always be grateful for this. Always be appreciative of this. Guru have said so many times the qualification of a disciple is this mood of gratitude towards Guru, to appreciate what he has given. Because we see Srila Gurudev just now. Who is he glorifying? So many times it's um, Srila Bhakti Pradhyan Kesha Maharaj. This is where he's giving all um, credit for anything that he can say at all. Constantly, again and again and again. So this appreciation of Guru, and this is what Pujapad uh, Maharaj is discussing with Sri Guru and Grace. So we're getting the whole spectrum. So it's very... Um, and Bhajan Rahasya also, the actual essence, the descriptions of what is Satya, what is Bhava, what is Premabhati. Without this understanding, how can we actually appreciate the whole picture? So we're very blessed. And Bhagavad Gita also making a very strong and powerful platform. So I was just really thinking this morning how grateful I am for these seminars and I hope that they will continue forever. And I will always offer my support, whatever that is, towards them. And uh, 
very important for devotees to get this whole picture. And Srimad Bhagavatam is the quintessence, is the top, is the pinnacle. And all these various aspects of Bhagavatam are being opened out to share. Perhaps another time. Perhaps Prakashat on what? On Chaitanya Charitam Rita. Well, yeah, we can do that in a week, even. <laughs> How blessed we are to have a birth where we have so much occupation, so much activity. Totally, there's no confusion. There's no like having to think, what shall I do now? We have such a storehouse, such a wealth of um, knowledge. And this is actually what we're going to discuss today. Denugusura. We've come from this tremendous festival. This festival that I was describing yesterday at the end of this Brahma Gamohan Leela is very significant. Because Krishna is going from withdrawing all of his manifestations, Vishnu manifestations, into just again being singular, Krishna alone. The dynamic is changing. It's a different dynamic now. Previously, for that whole 12 months, he was the little child of all of those different mothers. He was the calves, etc. And now, through the um, festival that actually went on, that night, that evening that he returned, it was the transition. Somehow or other Krishna adjusted all those emotions. He reconciled everything. This is extraordinary how we can understand to some degree how Krishna can lift a mountain and so on, but how to adjust these emotions, these very powerful Vatsanya Bhav that all the mothers felt. The mothers were still feeling that, but their focus was now again on Krishna, not on their own sons. But now, this is also a very significant point in the Bhagavatam. That was chapter 13. And now chapter 14 are the beautiful prayers by Lord Brahma begging for forgiveness. And in this chapter in particular, there's that beautiful verse, Tattain of Kampanas, Rusunik Shamaya, etc. These beautiful verses there by Lord Brahma begging for forgiveness for his offense. <clears throat> Try to at some point relate to the chapter titles, the, 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 the numbers also, then we can get the flow. We were talking about what is the meaning of religion in the Latin religio, to link. We can also link all the chapters, and we think we're linking with Krishna, but we're trying to link with this very much alive Srimad Bhagavatam. Don't forget what Bhaktivedanta Swami Shiva Prabhupada said. He said, on every single page of the Bhagavatam is Krishna's footprint. Every page of the Bhagavatam is Krishna's footprint. So we should approach the Bhagavatam with that kind of worship and honor and appreciation. So now, this Kumara age has definitely finished. And now, with this next pastime in chapter 15, Krishna is in his Poganda age. And many wonderful things are going to be revealed. His attraction for the gopis principally is really brought out at this point. Now it's in the Poganda age. Previously, they were just like playing in the dust together, so to speak. But now, this attraction has actually become manifest. And it's very beautifully described by the Acharyas. And it just gets thicker and thicker and thicker. After this pastime is Kaliya, the pastime of Kaliya Dina, the chastisement there. And then even more so, Krishna is paying his attention towards the gopis. So this is building from this Poganda age. Now he's six years old, between the age of six and ten. So, just to recap, who was the first demon? Bhutana. And how old is Krishna? Three or six days. The second demon? Shakatasura. How old was Krishna? About three months. Next demon? Srinamarata. And how old was Krishna? One year. And the next purification, not really demons entirely, but what was that? Now the money griever. And Krishna was about 18 months old. The next demon, Vatsasura. 
who was the calf demon. And how long was Krishna there? Krishna, yes, four and a half. He was out grazing the calves. So that's a big jump. We're moving through Krishna's birth. And then the next demon, Bakasura. So Krishna is about five years old, something like that. And then the next demon, Agasura. Very good. When you get these down in sequence, and the ages in particular, we're getting a picture of this personality Krishna. I was thinking today, we discussed so many times, you know, different characters and natures of great historical figures in history, and we get all understanding about them and so on. But somehow or other, in Krishna's character and qualities, sometimes we just are so much Aishwarya and glorifying him as the Supreme Lord, we don't properly absorb his actual very personal nature and characters. This is Madhurya, and we have the stamp on our passport, so to speak, coming from Srila Gurudev directly, and all our Rupa Dukha Acharyas to enter here. So never be afraid by prohibitions. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta puts so many prohibitions about the being cautious about treading into these subject matters. But at some point, we have to be confident that my Gurudev, this is what he wants. Gurudev gave his life for this. Every lecture, he's speaking about the different gradations of all the devotees, the different gradations of the bhaktas. He's describing extensively what is Baba, what is Prema and even more so the very esoteric descriptions between Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan. So now, oh, so after Agasura, that is Brahma Vimohan. So now we've come to the Poganda age. So now it's described how Krishna's waist is thinner, his feet are bigger, and Mother Earth has gone into more intense ecstasy. Because previously Krishna's feet were quite small, treading on her surface, but now they're actually even bigger and they're more firm and it's described that his footprints go deeper into the ground when he's actually walking. Those impressions are more clear. And if we can consider for a moment, Krishna appears in one universe at a time. So there are unlimited billions of universes. So it just happens that on this particular universe, at this particular time, 5,000 years ago, Krishna was actually here. So it's a rarity, it's not something that happens all the time. Because we're hearing it all the time, we're taking it for granted. But we should appreciate the rarity of actually Krishna's manifesting himself on this planet. And Mother Earth in particular is, and all her trees are blossoming with more vigor. And the plant life and the bird life, as I've described a couple of times now, how uh, she's orchestrating this remarkable natural setting for Krishna to appreciate. And it demonstrates, as I said yesterday, this very sattvic, very beautiful, sublime, sweet um, mood of spiritual culture, which is relating to all of nature. It's very gentle. It's very charming. It's very soft. And this is, this is where Krishna is in act. This is the spiritual kingdom. It's described actually that every day Krishna meets Vrinda and Purnamasti at Vrindakon and they discuss um, where he's going to go that day because Vrinda Devi and Purnamasti are both Yoga Maya. Yoga Maya is one tattva but two in Lila. So Purnamasti and Vrinda Devi. So they have to discuss every day. Oh, today, Denubasur is coming on the trail. Oh, he'll be in Talpa. So tell all the trees and all the plants and all the bushes to actually put on your best dress. Krishna, at this point, he's come around from Basant, where he first took the cows out. He went through Vatsavan, where Brahma stole the cows, which is behind Nandagal. But today, he's coming forward towards Mathura. If you remember the geography, Talma is towards Mathura. It's actually eight miles from Govrada. So they're going to walk approximately, as we look at it, about 10, 12 miles coming from Nandagal. But of course, these walking distances, we can't really calculate by our ability to walk that distance. I mean, we hear that Sanatana Swami, for example, 
Sanatana Goswami, for example, he would walk from Vrindavan to Govardhan, circumambulate Govardhan, then walk to Mathura, and then bend, bend Malukari, and then walk back to Vrindavan. It's described that he would do that like in a day. But actually, I don't think he did, because it's described also that he had many relationships with all the rich buses, and he would stop and he would talk with them. Oh, your daughter's just got married, oh, your son is getting married, oh, your children, etc. So that goes on, he had all these different relationships. So, so now, Krishna, he's stepping into this... Um, he's working on he's doing, he's doing something. He's stepping into this beautiful Vrindavan forest. And just prior to this, it's described how Nanda Baba, Upananda, Abhinanda, Sunanda, Nanda Nanda, all the brothers of Nanda, and all the elder Gopas, they sat and had a very important meeting. Now we think Krishna is eligible to take the cows out grazing. This was like a big upgrade. It, it relates with his age because now he's got that one. Now come to half manhood. Now he can take the cows. So for three or four days they had this meeting about the cows, etc. By the way, there are 108 different varieties of cows. It's described there are red cows, there are black cows, there are white cows, and there are yellow cows. He gives a whole description of all of the and eight pet cows and samples and a pet bull. Well not with that, pet pet bull. So all of these details are there in the common trees to excite us towards this spiritual land, this kingdom of Braj. So now, again, the same sort of festival is taking place as when he first took the calves out. But this is an even greater festival. This is Gopasthami itself, which happened in the month of And there's a four-day festival, a build-up to Krishna, it's very exciting. It's, the, it's all that they're talking about in Raj is that Krishna is about to take the cows out. And again, when he goes to take the cows out, all the different houses, they all bring out their arctic trays and they all offer. They make Krishna stop with the cowboy boys. And Krishna doesn't get out till very late on the first day because he's having to receive all this worship by all the Vrijvasis and also the Devas. They're also showering flowers to see him about to come out with the cows. That was with cows. Yeah, that was in Basan. She wanted to give him shoes and she wanted to give him an umbrella. That was at the very beginning. But Krishna refused, so Balade, he also had to refuse. All the cows have to have umbrellas and all the cows have to have shoes. <laughs> Krishna wouldn't take that at all. So now he's coming into this beautiful forest and um, he starts in these early verses by Shukadeva Goswami um, to describe this wonderful atmosphere of Vrindavan. And Krishna himself begins to describe this Madhava season, this spring season. And because Krishna's presence makes the spring season, as I just described, Vrinda Devi and Purnamasi, they're arranging for the path. They're also arranging for the different seasons. The different Lakshmi Devis of the different six seasons, they all come to Vrinda Devi. Oh, where shall we go today? And then Vrinda Devi, she directs all those seasons where they should actually go. Because later on, when Krishna starts performing his more amorous pastimes with Sri Radha and all the gopis, then he's wandering around in Madhyana Liga, midday pastimes, with the gopis through these different seasonal forests. Sometimes they come to a winter forest, and there's a couple of little gopis there with leaf jackets, and they put them on, and they come into a winter wonderland. Sometimes it's spring, sometimes it's the uh, hay month season, sometimes it's the autumn season. So these seasons are also changing. But at this point it's described by Shukadeva Goswami in the translation directly, but it's like a spring season that Krishna has come into. And it's 
it's not spring because we celebrate the Kartik. No, no, that's why I explained it. Okay. It's in oh, Kartik, yeah. and it's described that Gopasthami is Kartik. Yeah. But wherever Krishna goes, the different seasons can manifest okay. Okay. as his will, as his desire. And by the potency of Yoga Maya, no one is really questioning these changes of season. It's like the hot summer season will be there when Krishna wants to accentuate the beauty of the huge shady trees. The big banyan tree will become very much prominent when we can all sit under it and be cool, you know, on the summer heat, etc. So these different, it's all connecting, as I said, with the bird life, with the animal life, with the tree life, with the flowers, with the various fragrances. Because at this particular point, it's describing that the um, fragrance of millions of lotuses and uh, flowers that were present were very intoxicating. Again, when I hear these descriptions, it, it, it's so sublime an atmosphere that is being manifested. And then it's described that Krishna's five senses were utterly satisfied. All the atmosphere soaked in his ears were hearing the beautiful songs of the birds and the bees and the deers. With sweet pleasure he was listening to these sounds. And the touch, the sense of touch, was the gentle breezes and the scented cool moisture from the lakes touching his body. And the taste of the sweet clear water from the lakes and his eyes seeing all the beauty and his nose experiencing the fragrance of all this atmosphere. And in this condition of particularly noticing all this beauty, he begins to glorify Lord Balaram. He's actually aware that all the trees are bowing down to worship him. But he's saying that, oh no, they are actually worshiping you, Baladev. And there's very beautiful verses here where he's glorifying Baladev. The trees, by the way, they think that they have committed great offense to have taken birth as trees because they can't walk with Krishna through the forests. So they think, in a very mood of humility, that actually they have committed offense. That's why they're in the bodies of trees. But the Acharyas explain that this is not offense at all. These trees, even Lord Brahma wants to take birth as a stone in branch. So what to speak of the trees? They're also greatly elevated personalities, but because they can't walk with Krishna, then they bow all of their fruits to Krishna's feet, all their flowers, and the honey saps from their trunks also. The very beautiful fragrance. Anyone who is not telling Kamisha, he wants, he's glorifying himself. Uh, but now Krishna indirectly is glorifying Balaram. But there's another reason also, as we discussed yesterday, why is he glorifying Balaram specifically? Because Balaram didn't come out cow grazing for five days after the Brahman Kamalman Lila. He was a little bit unhappy that Krishna, who was his dear most confidant, hadn't shared with him what was actually happening when Lord Brahma stole the cows. So Lord Brahma, uh, Balaram Prabhu, is coming out of that for the first time. This pastime is happening about a week or so after uh, this Brahma Vimohan Lila. So now Baladev is coming out and Krishna is going to allow Baladev for many other reasons also, but to kill this demon. So again, Baladev will be placed in the center like that. So these are all aspects of this pastime. And then he glorifies Baladev as being the Adi Purush. And he says that all the birds and all the beasts, they're all coming to glorify you. And he even suggests, at this point, that actually Baladev goes to secret places to meet his beloveds. So this is another indication of the age transition to Poganda. Now Krishna is old enough to meet with the gopis. This, this Urvara is manifested in the gopis' hearts. And so many descriptions of this beauty of this intoxicating beauty of um, the Vrindavan forest. And then it's again described the frivolity of their childlike pastimes. And I was thinking today how 
all children love to play. Actually, up to the age of about five or six years old, children live in some kind of other world of just play. They're play acting all the time. It's only as they grow older and they're chastised so many times and they start to lose their natural, uninhibited natures, according to... Yes, they lose all that carefree nature, but it's their nature to actually play all the time. That's what children do, they play. So here, this is being demonstrated by Krishna himself, playing all the time. Chasing the birds, chasing the monkeys, playing with the ducks in the lake, um, imitating the frogs, wrestling with each other, pretending to be bulls with each other, playing thieves and emperors, etc. with each other. All these different games constantly, again and again. Krishna is like a minefield of newer and newer exciting games for boys. And the boys are in complete anticipation of what will be the next game that we're going to play. You can send Krishna book too. Yeah. And he puts his hand in the mouth and he goes, and I wonder he's telling what are you doing? <laughs> Raja is saying that Krishna puts his hand inside the mouths of his two big dogs and he pulls their tongues and then takes his hand out again. And Mother Yashoda sure become very disturbing. So these types... Just on the chronology, Krishna has already lifted Govardhan. No, he no, 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 has he, he has not lifted Govardhan. Has, no. he, has he liberated Kalia? No. Well, that's contentious, Manasmita, because Jiva Goswami says with great praman that actually he has. Jiva Goswami writes that the Kaliya pastime happened before this Dene Pasura pastime. <coughs> but according to Shukadev Goswami, this pastime is in chapter 15 and the Kaliya pastime is in chapter 16. Did you tell them where you are? No, Jiva Goswami says that actually Shukadev Goswami was so much absorbed in Bach that he actually gave the wrong chronology at this point. That actually Kaliya should have been first. But we'll stick with the way Shukadeva Goswami has presented it. But no, Pralanga has not gone. If I sent that list of demons to you. So you have those 21 demons. You can see clearly through there. All of you can have that list to look at. Yeah. No, I didn't mention that. You mentioned that. I mentioned that it happened. You said it comes after. Well, the chapter title is number 20. Yeah. When actually that chapter happens. We're still in chapter 14, 15. So it's not described at that point. We can relate it to that. But at the same time, it's actually a place. It happened before Brahma of the Lord. Uh, well, that time was We can talk about that. Because I always understood that the acceptance of those as his wives was the fact that they had to appear naked before him. And that itself was an acceptance that now you are my wife. If you were appearing like that, so you have to be like an internal control. Yes. You can leave the class. No, no, I understand. I understand. But I'm trying to present it something more chronologically so we can begin to get some sort of at least material handle on the entire picture. It's just like any musician has to learn the notes first before he can fly and just play without looking at them. So first of all, we should... Regarding the chronology, Jiva Goswami says that he readjusted it according to the actual chronology, time one after the other, mm -hmm. because he said Shukadev Goswami spoke about things sometimes out of order mm -hmm. because his particular moods or bhav mm -hmm. incited a remembrance of one and then another and then another. Mm -hmm. But Jiva Goswami and Bhaktivinoda Thakur, mm -hmm. they give this other order 
based on the actual time frame. Does Rahim Ramadan say that Kali happened before the Empress also? Um, Rahim Ramadan says that Kali happened before the No, Kali happens after the Empress. That's what she did. The only difference here, actually, in the bar, is his relationship with the Gopis specifically. What is the that? What is the height or intensity of that relationship? This is where, in reading the commentaries, this is where the difference will be. Obviously, at a bit later date, then that intensity is going to be more special, more brought out. That bar will be have increased because. It, when we read Ananda Vrindavan and Chambi, the young Gopi's hearts are building, 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 building to such an intensity that when that flute sounds at night of the Sara Purnima, they cannot think of, they are ready to burst apart. And when they hear that flute, there's not even the remotest hesitation. They just run straight to the forest. They're about to explode with this bar. This bar has built so intensely within them over a couple of years in their attraction to Krishna. It can't be contained anymore. So in relation to what you're saying, I see it um, specifically in relationship to the Gopi's moods, this chronology. So now Krishna, he's glorified Balaram, his brother, greatly saying that he is the um, one that all of nature is actually worshipping. <coughs> but of course, it's all worshipping him. And then it's described also that Baladev sometimes would personally massage Krishna's lotus feet. And sometimes, uh, no, sorry, sorry. Krishna would massage Balaram's lotus feet. What did I say? Yeah, you said that. No, I had to go the other way Yes, Krishna would massage Balaram's lotus feet. But Balaram never massaged Krishna's lotus feet. It's a very wonderful relationship to examine this brotherly mood between Baladev and Krishna. It's a real relationship because remember he's just come out of being Lakshma and was told all the time to do these rather unpleasant tasks. He had to take Sita to the forest, he had to do so many things and he vowed at that time, I'll never become the younger brother again. So now he's definitely the older brother and he's going to remain the older brother. And even though it's only a weak difference, practically, in age, still in Vedic culture, it's like the difference between Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha. There's actually a difference between the two. Hiranyaksha is the elder, Hiranya, even though they came out almost simultaneously. Well, Hiranyakashipu is the elder. He came out after, yeah. but he was conceived first. So he's in the back of the room. Ranyaksha is in the front of the room because he was conceived second. Okay. But he came out first, but he's actually younger. Yes, I understand that. But I thought it was the other way around. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. okay, so anyway, but this um, relationship between Balaram and Krishna is very special and it should be very much focused and appreciated and meditated upon. What is this special? Because in chapter. What chapter is it? I think it's chapter. Uh, 55, I described before that the Shamantaka jewel is actually um, stolen from Satyajit and Krishna and Balaram. They, Satyadanya is his name, who stole this jewel. And Krishna and Balaram, they pursue Satyadanya on a, on, a cha on a chariot. And Satyadanya is on a horse that can ride 900 miles before it stops. But when the horse has ridden 500 miles, it stops and dies, and then Satyadanya is running. And Krishna and Balaram are pursuing him. And then Krishna takes his Sudhasar chakra and chops the head off Satyadanya. And then he goes to look for the Shalataka jewel. And he can't find it in the clothing of Satyadanya. And he looks in his saddlebags and says, I can't find the jewel. Comes back to Balaram and says, the jewel is not here. And Balaram looks at him knows that his brother is that omniscient personality. Why is he even pretending to look here? He's a little impatient. He's brought us all this way, and he's pretending in front of me, Balaram, that he doesn't know where the jewel is. And actually at that point, it's described by the Acharyas that Baladev again becomes a little bit unhappy that he wasn't 
invited into Krishna's confidence. And he goes to the city of Matila, which is very close by where this happened, and he stays there for several years with Janaka Maharaj. That is described at this time is when he taught Duryodhana how to use the club. But again, it's the same principle of Baladev just deciding just to move back. And like Kurukshetra, the war of Kurukshetra, he didn't enter into that war. He decided to go on a pilgrimage. So that this brotherly relationship is very unique. And it's not just straightforward ABC. There are all sorts of emotional swirlings within this relationship that we can appreciate. Like any relationship. It has so many extra things in it. So one day, Sridhar, Subhar, Stoka Krishna and the others, they were requesting Krishna with totally selfless love and desire that they wanted to taste these tal fruits. And at that time, these tal fruits, they're, they're very large. And when they're ripe, they have a beautiful fragrance. And this fragrance was coming through by Reverend Maya's arrangement, coming amongst all the Kalman boys. And they were begging Krishna to actually we want to taste these fruits. But my dear Krishna and Balaram, there are these two donkey demons, and they are man eaters. They have eaten men who are alive. And they even kill the birds that fly over the Taliban forest. So um, Krishna and Balaram, they love donkeys. As if we can't defeat donkeys, you know, thinking that just a donkey is a donkey. And uh, but this is inspiring this viraras that the suckers get great pleasure from. This is one of the rasas that the suckers really appreciate, this heroic acts. And then um, Krishna and Balaram are placed in the front of all the cowboy boys and they march into Taliban forest. And Baladev, because it's described that this demon that's about to be killed, he represents what? Ignorance. So this ignorance can ultimately only be purified by Guru. So Baladev is a Kan Guru Guru Tattva. Ultimately, that's his, this is Baladev. So it's Baladev who's going to... Now how does Guru purify this ignorance? He is in us to perceive our anartas or our ignorance. This is how he purifies us. He's never going to come and just magically take away our anartas, etc. He's not going to sprinkle some dust over our heads. I remember once I was suffering greatly in Matura Martin. I hadn't slept actually about five days with malaria. And I wanted the Buddha to do some sort of miracle to me. And he was sending up prasadam from his plate. You remember? You made some soup for me in Matura. And I wanted this kind of miracle I was wanting. And then finally Guru just banged me on the head like that. And nothing actually happened. <laughs> because that's not the process, really. The process is the Guru will inspire us to be reflected internally to actually see what is my anarcha, what is my problem. Gurudev said many times, I can guide you on this path, but you have to walk on it. It's just like a child. You can't walk for your child. You can make all the supports and everything else, but the child has to walk by itself. Similarly, Baladev can inspire this um, purification of ignorance, but we have to actually purify the ignorance. It's not Krishna will come and take away that ignorance. They'll give us all support. But we have to make the decision, no, I don't want to go that way. That's the ultimate decision that we have to make with great resolution. So, Baladev, he walks forward into this Taliban forest. He grabs one of these Tal trees and he begins to shake it very vigorously. And all the Tal fruit, they all drop on the ground, making a lot of noise. And then this thing, the Surah, he just sees red. I mean, a demon is so proud by nature. But who has the a front to actually come into my forest that I'm guarding for King Kunks and do like this. Doesn't he know that I eat men alive? And Timur Surah just came roaring out, screaming with rage, unbridled rage. 
and he was a massive demon. Actually, not just a donkey, he was huge. And he came out, and he immediately turned around his hind legs, and he whacked Faraday right in the chest. Faraday didn't even flinch. It was as if a lotus had just gone against his chest. He hadn't moved at all. And then, De Nunesura became totally frustrated with that and roared and screamed even more loudly and swung around again to take a second huge kick at Balade. And Balade just very easily, with one hand, caught him by the hind leg and swung him around so fast that he lost his life through that centrifugal uh, energy, what would you call it? Force. And slung him into a tree. And then that tree, by the weight of it, fell over and knocked another tree, which knocked another tree. It was like a domino effect started to happen. All the trees started to fall over. But then, of course, Denubasura wasn't alone. He had actually, like, hundreds of followers and so on who were also in the bodies of donkeys. And they also all came roaring out. So Krishna wanted to join in the fun now. So then they just began swirling all these different donkeys around and around and around until they'd actually taken the life of all those donkeys and they were all in the top of the trees and practically so much of the forest had actually been broken down by these um, demons there was some forest left of course but a lot of the forest and all the fruits were all on the ground but the suckers wouldn't touch them at all because they had been contaminated by the blood of the demons so we get a picture of the culture of the suckers. They may have been hungry, they may have been tasty, they would not have dreamt of touching something contaminated. They were very sort of a high Brahminical natural standard of the suckers. It's very nice to appreciate this point. And then um, it's described that the Polinda tribes people. They actually came in and washed those fruits and took them home and so on. <coughs> and then it's described that um, everyone, of course, congratulated Krishna and Baba so much. They were so happy. They were the complete heroes of the young boys. This is their move, the young children, six year olds. And then they. Um, oh, the demigods were so relieved when Denudasura had been killed because Denudasura had also challenged the demigods. So the demigods were raining down flowers. All of these demons were a disturbance for the demigods. So when they saw, because they always knew that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but they were still, they would come under some sort of illusion to be fearful when Krishna was attacked nevertheless to create a mood of anxiety towards Krishna, a mood of mamata towards Krishna, a mood of um, increasing sweetness towards Krishna. But again on this topic of Aishwarya and Madhurya, how could they be influenced by the sweetness of this pastime? They couldn't break from their staibar of Aishwarya all the way through these different demigods. They can't break from that. That is who they are, that is their nature. Their nature is to worship Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They can't go outside of that because they don't have the mercy to actually do that. They weren't born in a particular situation. And this should give us appreciation for our situation, that we've been born in the most fallen condition. But nevertheless, we've been... One time I asked Buddha, he was talking about Buddha, being a Jnani Bhakta, which means understanding Krishna's Aishwarya. I said, Guru, you're saying this about um, Uddhava being so high devotee and a Jnani Bhakta, but you're telling us to go even higher than this. How is that possible? And at that time, Guru looked at me and said, you are like clay. I can mold you how I want. <laughs> this was his answer, which you know, I couldn't understand for quite a few years afterwards because we have our particular saiva and that's fixed. So how can we really alter that fixed nature? Nevertheless, this is what he said. And he is molding us. He's molding us by continually giving us this sweet harigata. If you live in other sanghas, you don't have so much of this. They actually take more interest in exercising the muscles of the mind and academia and intelligence, etc. 
and trying to grapple with various you know, intricacies of Gyan and so on, and think that's the highest. They become illuminated by a taste of Gyan. Gyan has a very illuminating um, sweetness about it, when your mind is very clear and etc. Madhurya is something different, it's something of the heart, it's another nature altogether that actually goes to a place of consideration. So I'm trying to just think about that. So, <clears throat> then it's described that Krishna joyfully returns home after the killing of the Yukasura. And now Shubhade Goswami describes this Goduli pastime very clearly in this particular chapter. How Krishna is powdered by the dust <coughs> of the cows. But he wears a garland. And the garland doesn't have a single spot of dust on it. Because Sridhar and Subhal instead of Krishna, Mother Mandal, any little particle of dust that comes off, they take off the beginning. So his garland is just splendid, it's beautiful, it's shining. They won't let the dust come on his garland. It's very beautiful. This Sridhar is described when he goes to sleep at night, he just prays to the moon to quickly finish your orbit so that I can be with Krishna again. Okay? They can't bear even to go to sleep. And Subhal, it's described, never lets go of Krishna's hand, even in his dreams. He'll never let go of Krishna's hand. He's always, this is how much they love Krishna. So this is a consideration when we come to talk about the gopis, how Krishna, even though this love is bestowed on him by all the disciples, he's ready to leave them for four or five hours every single day because of his greater love for Sri Radha and the gopis. So it's an increasing appreciation of the intensity of affection on the bridge buses that we're actually walking through in this 10th canto of Bhagavatam. It's all about that area of love. This is the foundation of Bhagavatam. But it's love towards the object of Krishna. And now it's described that the gopis, when Krishna returns, they very boldly come to taste the sight of Krishna coming back into Braj. And they give Krishna beautiful sidelong glances at this time that wasn't described previously, because now, as I've said, he's in Boganda age. And the gopis, they not only looked at Krishna, but they stared at him for a long time when they thought no one else was watching them. The beauty of this personality, we cannot begin to imagine. We hear about this beauty. Beauty is the first quality of Krishna. Krishna is Bhagavan. Six qualities. What is the first quality? Beauty, Shri. The first quality. And then the other three qualities are coming from like Angus. The Angi is beauty. The first aspect is beauty. And then this strength, fame, and opulence is coming from the beauty. And then the last two qualities, renunciation and vairagya, uh, knowledge. knowledge and renunciation are actually the effulgence of fame. They're not directly qualities, they're attributes of qualities. Renunciation is some of the negative thing actually. And knowledge you can find in a library. It doesn't have that little person behind it. But the other four qualities are very personal. And the most personal is beauty. And the gopis are just spellbound. Not only that, but Krishna is reciprocating with them. This is, and it's described very beautifully. This is nice. He said they looked with shyness, hiding their faces, jubilation, and submission. You can write these three down because they're very beautiful. Shyness, jubilation, and submission. These are very, very attractive qualities that the gopis were showing this mood of submission to Krishna, but also jubilation and very chaste shyness was there. So these three exemplary qualities, there's nothing conditioned, there's nothing material in this relationship we examine it, in this mood, these descriptions, they're only sweet. 
So then it's described that uh, Mother Yashoda, Rohini, they gave the boys so much food and so on, that they would never eat at forbidden times. And one forbidden time to eat is on sunset, it's described. So again, this is a, a picture of the culture that we're getting. We're getting so much um, of the atmosphere and the culture by these types of things. They would not eat. You know the story of sunset from the uh, fourth canto or third canto. How Lord Brahma is, uh, was he, from his backside, he created the demons. And the demons ran towards him with lust. And Lord Brahma didn't know how to deal with that. So he ran to Krishna and asked, what should I do? Krishna said, drop that body. That body is like the conception. So Lord Brahma, he drops that body. And that body takes the form of a most tantalizing young girl. And the demons, they run to that girl to satisfy their lust. And that girl is described as the embodiment of the sunset. So the embodiment of all lust. When the sun goes down, that's when the robes and the dacoids and anyone who wants material enjoyment, their desires increase with the sunset. And that's at night you have all the bars and all the rest of it, they're all at night. For devotees, they have arti at that time. Then they take some prashad, then they go to rest. Because there's nothing else really happening after 7 or 8 or 9 o'clock at night. If you think, what do you personally do in your days after 9 or 10 o'clock at night? Unless you're watching television and movies and engaging in some sort of other activity, then you will be resting. So this is like Vedic culture. And the dawn, contrary to that, he dropped before the demigods. And the demigods take the dawn and they sport with it. Because the dawn is a beautiful time for prayers and mantras, etc. I can remember in my tour in Durasa, where we live, we look across the Yamuna in the early morning, about 5 o'clock or something. And we see in Bishram Ghat and all the different Ghats in Matura, they'd all be ringing bells and there'd be lamps going and there'd be so many mantras chanting. We could almost see them like rising out of the morning mist coming from Matura. And that such an auspicious mood would actually prevail. So this is the morning hours, the devotees engage in Mongolati chanting and so on. So this is just a reference there, but they wouldn't eat during sunset. They eat after that. And then, of course, Krishna and Balaram would be beautifully massaged and dressed again. And again, Mother Yashoda is not allowed to dress Krishna anymore now. She used to take a hand in dressing him, but now she's not even allowed. Now Krishna has his servants to be dressed, and he'll dress himself also. So again, this is an idea, to get the idea of this changing age, which I find very inspiring. Now, um, I just want to go back here to discuss who is Dainukasura, this mood of ignorance, and ignorance of knowledge of the soul, because a gross materialistic intelligence is like a jackass, or is foolish. So I just wanted briefly at this point, I'm sure you all know this already. Well, I'm going to test you and see if you so we will just go over briefly what are the anartas or what is, how is that ignorance understood by the devotees? It's understood as being anarta. What is the meaning of anarta? Arta means wealth and an means without or useless, something that is useless. Anarta is useless. So it's described there are four principal anartas. And each of those anartas, they have four subheadings describing those anartas. So I thought it might be helpful just to bring that again to the consciousness, to remember what are the anartas that they sort of represents that Guru is going to inspire us to purify. So we're coming out of Braj a little bit, but still I thought it was of value at this point. So what is perhaps the first anartas? Someone can say not you are. Anyone else can say? Tattva Vibram. This means unsure about the truth. And 
It's called Swarup Brahm, is the heading. Swarup Brahm means illusion about Brahm. We're talking about Brahm in your classes. By the way, if you haven't come to Pranashakra's classes, you're really missing something. He's really giving something very sacred and special. Right? Good. Uh, in the afternoon. Yeah, late afternoon is wonderful. But in this case, it's B H R. Brahma. Correct? What do you say? Yes. Illusion. Vibram. Vibram. Vibram means illusion. It's not the same spelling. Oh, it's, it's not the same spelling. B R. B H B H B H spelling is yeah it's all the same spelling. This is not. Yeah. Different Yes. 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 It's not Brahman. It's illusion. It's illusion about Brahman. Yeah. So there's a verse. Mayanu dasya jivasya neya narta chatur vida. Uh, Kritu Balyam Chaparado Sat Krishna Hatva Brahma Vibram. So the first we're saying is the heading, the title is Tatva Brahma, like you're saying. And underneath there, there's four subheadings. One is Swarup Brahma, which means unsure about my identity. I don't know quite who I am in relationship to Krishna or this material world. This is actually Sammanda Gyan. And the second, underneath this same heading, is Para Tattva Brahma. I'm not quite sure what is the supreme object of worship. Is it Shiva? Is it Vishnu? Is it Brahma? Is it Durgama? Is it Surya Day? Who should I worship? Para Brahma. That's the second one. And then the third is Sadhya Sadhana Brahma. But I'm not quite sure what type of sadhana I should perform. Should it be in Aishwarya? Should it be in Madhurya? How, how should I go forward with my sadhana? Understand there are, there's the sadhana, there's the sadhana, and there's the sadhya. And there's the Sadguru. So what does Sad mean? The Sadak, the Sadhan, the Sadhya, and Sadguru. It's all Sad. What does Sad mean? Huh? Pure. Pure. Sad is pure, correct? Can you translate it as that? True. 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 Eternal. Eternal. Yes. Substance. Yes. So the sadhak, sadhak is practicing the sadhan to attain, attain the sadhya under the guidance of sadguru. So it's all an eternal process. But this this um, third subheading in the tattva brahm um, category. So then the last is Bayam Virodi Vishaya. This is Brahma. This is either Mayavada or impersonal like that. So actually I've sent you a list yesterday of these. It's the Mayavada. It's called Bayam Virodi Vishaya. Bayam Virodi Vishaya. Brahma. And it means Mayavada. It means you have no understanding of actually what is the path, but you actually think that your satisfaction and your dominion over everything is the goal. Mayavadi. Mayavadi is how it's described. Mayavad or impersonal? Not knowing who you want to That's the first. That's Swaru, Swaru, Brahma. Second, Para. Don't know what Para Tattva. Don't know which is done. Third is Sadhya Sadhana. What is the process, the path? And the fourth is this Vayam Virodi Vishaya. Vishaya, thinking that I am the Vishaya. Yes, can say about that. But there's two others that are like bewildered by sense of God. So it's specifically saying Vayavad or impersonal. So if you give me your email addresses, I can send you these in. But I thought we should just. 
Facem la Asia, să ne încercăm. Yes, definitely it's done. Yeah, yeah. It's also this one. Yeah. And then this Hridai Dubalian. In, in this verse, Krita Dubani comes first. There's no order. So you're an artist. It's not like a chronology of artist. No, no, it's not order. It's not like I clear this and then I'm ready for that. But these are always, like Pratishna, for example, is present right through to the very end. And these other um, first four materials, they can be present right through. It's not a gradation. I try to see it that way also. But it's, it's not a gradation. It's just simply form types of anarchists which need to be it's not a progressive thing no, no. this verse that I quoted starts off with Pritai Valyam and then Aparad and then Sat Trishna and then Tatpapit Brahm which is not the order that I usually give it in also but I was just going according to this verse so Pritai Valyam weakness of heart and this is attachment to useless objects that have no connection with Krishna. I was trying to think like what? What is, a, what is an attachment to useless objects that have no connection with Krishna? Attachment to fame. Fame, yes, my own fame. But no, no, this is later. These are material objects because they come more subtle in the other subheadings because the next one is hypocrisy, the next is envy, the next, the last is pratishtha. So this pratishtha is more <coughs> like that. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he said in one of his writings in the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that there is a whole forest filled with trees of anartas, but there's one huge tree in the very center of the forest, and this is pratishtha. And he says it doesn't just reside in the sannyasis. He said everywhere is this pratishtha on all different levels. When I want my glorification for... When we're hearing this story of Krishna and Balaram, the great central figures in all of Braj, this just by hearing the pastime is going to erode that mentality of wanting to take center stage. We're not on center stage. Krishna, very comfortably, is on center stage with the greatest of humility, simultaneously. And why should we try for that, you know, position? It's not our position. Our position is to glorify that personality. Still, the nature of this conditioned material world is that we come under that influence of Mahamaya. And we, again, want to put forward our agenda. I think Facebook mostly is dealing with that actually. Everyone is trying to present themselves as someone very wonderful rather than actually their real selves. It's often like that. Anyway, so that's Kridai Nubalian. Did you get those four? The second was hypocrisy. That's what I was asking you. So, what is this um, attachment to useless objects? <coughs> Like what? Give me an example. I think it's more in objects, like house, like um, clothes, money, money, clothes, cars. Yes, these are quite gross. It starts gross and it goes to subtle. This is subtle. There's a gradation here in the subtle. What's confusing, it means attaching to these things for your own purpose and not employing them in the service of Krishna. Yes. Because anything, Nirbanda, Krishna, Sambanda, Yukta, Bhairagi, which you think, yes. if you take that same thing, yes. Prabhupada was telling the story about Prabhupada accepting the watch. Yes. That wasn't attachment to worthless things. But there came a time when all the disciples wanted to imitate the externals of Srila Prabhupada, yes. so there was this whole thing about. You had to have a big watch, yes. and then you had to have a briefcase, yes. and then you had to have a tape recorder inside, yes. and not necessarily for the service, but for the prestige and impression that it created. Yes, again, partition. But actually, the story of Ramanuja is even more clear when his disciples went and took the jewelry of that very wealthy couple, 
and the lady, she rolled over in the night and she wanted them to take the other earring because they'd only taken one. Yeah. And then they thought that she went around and they ran away and her husband chastised her. You know, why didn't you roll over more carefully so they could have taken the other one? And the disciples were seeing this witness of total detachment. And then Ramanuja, he sent some other people to go and take the incumbents of the sannyasis and take them, uh, take them away to somewhere else. And the next morning they were seeing what would be the effect. And they were, oh, so angry. Who has taken my coatings? Who has taken my cloth? And become really completely like, well, it's deranged because they lost their underwear. Two cloths, two pieces of cloth. So it's not about what you have. It's like how attached, this is what Maharaj is saying, how attached we are to what we imagine is ours when everything actually ultimately is Krishna's. This is with lack of affection for Krishna, these Anajas are there. The more affection and attraction we have for Krishna by hearing these pastimes, then naturally these Anajas are by themselves going to go away. By the way, Srila Gurudev said one morning, I remember specifically in Bhavalava, we were walking just as the sun was rising and Ashram Maharaj was there and he was Govinda Bhakta at that time and he asked Gurudev, should we dwell on our anartas while we're chanting? And Guru, he jumped like vigorously. Never! If you dwell on your anartas, more will come. It's not our process to dwell on these anartas. But in a class, we should understand what are the anartas, what is the enemy. So how can I purify it? If you're in ignorance, which is what the Surah represents, then how will we ever make any inroads to purify these anartas? See? So it's very clear. This collecting of useless things. I think it's more about the mentality with which one does this attachment for things because one can be quite attached to not needing things and be always extremely focused on having as little as, as possible. I think it's more about the attachment, like you said. It's only about it's only about the attachment. It's, about the it's only about attachment. You could be attached, like um, Pundarik Vidyanidhi. He had so much external wealth, and then when he heard that verse, he just smashed it all in a moment. Broke the mirrors, you know, tore his hair, tore his rich silk clothes. wasn't There was no drop of attachment. It's only the anarta of attachment. You can have a billion dollars, you can have a beautiful house in Austria by the mountains, but be so unattached to it. It's not about what you have, it's how much attached we are. Very simple. It's that attachment. Absolutely. This is the point. This is the point. Unless we're attached to Krishna and being in a sangha with devotees, unless we're attached to that association, for example, unless we become, develop attachments with devotees, then how can we proceed? We'll naturally gravitate to find attachment with materialists. If you don't have attachment with devotees, that's what will happen. And then materialists, they got everything wrong way around. So I'm not allowed to tell it. Uh, that's both. Mm. Yeah, how does do that with the product? Because means to be attached to this world. Um, and a real vision means to always <coughs> be higher devotees. How I can serve the higher devotees? And when you develop that vision, then ignorance is gone. This anarta is called Kridai, which means heart. It's a deep anarta. It's in the heart. It needs to be purified. Guru will shine the light. But we have to reject those desires. That's the point that I made previously. But then we have to accept the better desires. That's the process. That's the process. That's the process. This is why we're in this material world in the first place. <coughs> we wanted to enjoy Krishna's... Yeah. I'm also thinking the word um, jealousy, because that's not there in the spiritual world, jealousy. No. So there's one thing which is not related to very good, Rinda. Very good. She's saying how jealousy is something that is also not related to Krishna. Because as I, I've described through these pastimes, there was no lust, there was no envy at all in the suckers. There was no scent of that type of mentality whatsoever. That's a picture of the spiritual world. And that state of consciousness we can achieve by taking proper sadhu and by 
carefully trying to read ourselves. But the process, as I said in the very first day, is not anarta nivriti, it's arta pravriti. It's to look at the positive, look at the wealth that is actually there in our ability to absorb these sweet impressions of Krishna. That is the, that is the real process. If we're always looking at the negative, like well, they said, if you think of these anarchas, more will come, just like a ghost. If you start talking about ghosts, that will attract them. If you start talking too much about your own problems, who's going to be impressed by you? Right? You're just gonna, there's going to be two people who think you have a problem. First of all, you thought you just had a problem, but if you try and share it with someone else, then two people think you have a problem, so your problem becomes bigger, it's more compounded. So, Hridayu Balyam. And then... Krishna, <laughs> all the other Anartas, <coughs> like attachment to self enjoyment, everything, they become weaker and weaker as we grow older. But Pratishta becomes younger and stronger ah, as we grow older. Very fearful. Very fearful. You heard what he said? Pratishta become, as you get older, the senses get weaker. So perhaps you won't want to materially enjoy gross objects as much as when you were younger. But the dynamic of Pratishta is that it gets stronger and stronger and stronger the other way around. If we're not in process, if we're not in this, and if we are in this path, we have no problem. If we are in this path, even chanting one Harinam mantra a day, ultimately, even reading for five minutes a day, we're in process. We're, it's going to be purified. We just have to hold on to that. For sure, the mercy will come. But this Pratishtha is the biggest tree in the forest that we have to be cautious about. Putting myself as a saint, and as Brother was saying, when we hear this. It will only go away if you associate with your Vaishnava. And we have seen many times in Buddha's presence, any big, big Vaishnava becomes, they dwindle. They have no more, nobody is impressed by what they have to say or not. Do they have at once? He melts there. This is interesting because it's a little bit like the difference between Aishwarya and Madhurya. <clears throat> if you're more inclined to that mood of Aishwarya, then you're rolling out so many verses and you're actually making an impression of your own importance actually in various deliveries and so on. When you're speaking and so on, you can be like that. This Aishwarya, the Madhurya, it doesn't have that sort of atmosphere to it. Madhurya is much more... Um, Internal, it's, it's more soft. It doesn't have that aggressiveness. Actually, we're trying to maintain. Anyway, you understand more than me, I'm sure. I don't, you know, haven't worked on any of these. I don't know. No, no, I'm going to finish. I'm not gonna finish. If you keep oh, stop interrupting yeah. about Pratishta, let, <laughs> let, let me just clear it. So, Amara. <laughs> Four types of aparad. Aparad to um, seva aparad, nama aparad, dharma aparad, and other living entities. Jiva aparad, I should say. So seva, nam, dham, and jiva. Aparad. Aparad, what does that mean? The longer. No, what is it? What's the etymology of aparad? Means that which is what does Appa mean? Against. Against who? Radha. Appa Rad. Against Radha. Against affection. Against, against affection. affection, yes, against worship, against bhakti. Appa Rad. Not attracting her. Not attracting her. It's actually Appa Rad. Against worship. Worship. Yeah. This means that when you perform Aparad, yes. it distances you from worship. Or the object of worship. And the object of worship is Sri Radha. Okay, the last one. Asana Krishna. Which means what? Material. Thirst. Thirst for material objects or Swagaloka or mystic cities or liberation mukti, these four. 
So quite simple, but it's, it's refreshing to actually have a sheet. If you give me your email, I'll send you a sheet, and periodically, you know, once every few months, whatever, you can just glance at this sheet, and you can appreciate how I started to make any progress with clearing these an artists, these useless baggage that I'm carrying. So this is what David Musura represents. So again, we only just got through one demon. But as I said before, I don't mind at all just doing less demons. We're not going to finish all the 21 demons. But at least you're getting an insight into one, each one more fully. And I think the quality rather than the quantity personally is more important. So I have one more class. And we have Kalia, we have uh, Govardhan, we have Keshi Neeman, Pranamba Sura, um, Vyama, Indra, so many there. But um, we not, that's for you. You can also go through these yourself. One last thing about the demon. We mentioned the other day, when I had the class in the morning, Bhakti Vinod Thakur also relates to what these demons represent from a higher perspective. Right. In that, in his Krishna Samhita, he says that the Anartas, rather than just being obstacles to basic bhakti, can also be obstacles to coming into Rag Mark. What he calls the, the, the path no, I'm going to focus on that up. <laughs> ah, Pratishtasha. Les Maras. <laughs> which, which, uh, the path of attachment he calls Rod Mark. And he says that Dedo Kastra, he's the guardian of the fruits. He's not allowed to taste them. Right. And the fruit, the body, <coughs> is actually to come into this spontaneous attachment to Krishna, to come into this stage of advanced asakti and then bhav. So he can't taste this, and he doesn't want anyone else to taste it either. And so Bhaktivinoda Thakur says specifically, this is really interesting, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he wrote this, you know, 100 years ago, 100 years ago. He says, our acharyas have written many books and given many instruction. And the Dato Kasturas will tell you not to read these books, that you should not read these books. But he said, but they wrote them to be read. And anyone who thwarts that has that anarta of Dano Kasura. Not to aspire for that level of bhakti and not to study and hear about from our charis about it. But we should take this for ourselves and not be restricted ourselves. I just want to quickly read because I didn't read you any of the uh, who is um, the Emperor previously. Gabi Samita states in previous life, he was the son of Bali named Sahasrasika, and he offended the Rasarishi by disturbing him while he was in meditation, yes. He was enjoying with 10,000 women, and he was told to become an ass because he was behaving like an ass. Now, Bhakti Vinod Thakur adds um, in his Shikshan Rita that Balaram kills two demons. I've more or less said this, but I'm going to say the actual words of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. But the contamination represented will have to be removed by the devotee's own endeavors. Uh, this is the mystery of Raj Denuka. He's an overburdened, load-carrying, which causes total ignorance of eternal identity, false misconception about name and sorry from. Okay, so oh, that's what that, I was saying what I've already said. Regarding that burden? Dr. Vinodak calls it the burden of the regulative principles. Now don't misunderstand that. It's not that it's a burden we shouldn't follow them. He says to carry the regulative principles without understanding the purpose of them. Just to follow the rules and regulations forever, thinking that is the sum total and the final objective. So carrying the burden of regulative principles without understanding that we want to move into the platform of spontaneous attachment. There's a poem by Srila Pramodananda Saraswati, and he's talking about offering the yagya, the ghee into the fire. And the great pundit, he's offering all the ghee into the yagya, but he never takes a drop for himself. He's always trying to explain it out. 
He's never actually going that path. He's never actually walking there. This is like someone like Maharaj is describing, who is very carrying this burden and is more than likely ready to tell everyone else that they have to carry it and trying to dictate it, etc. You should do this, you should do that, and so on. Actually missing the entire heart. Because if we look, there's a book called The Beautiful Way of Life. And it has all the rules and regulations that we have to follow. But every single rule is explained very clearly of how it literally elevates your consciousness. For example, if you don't eat on sunset, you will be away from the passionate influence that's on the planet all the time. You know, the different modes of nature throughout the day. And if you follow a life accordingly, you can actually elevate your consciousness so simply. Every rule and regulation has a beautiful, sublime purpose and reality to it that we should know. Otherwise, we'll be carrying the burden of the rules and regulations. Enuga Sora. He tried. He became a great. He's our teacher. <laughs> he is. He is. <laughs> Jai, 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 Jai,